during this third part of the session, uh, I'm going to uh, reflect a little bit more about what um, what actually language means, and um, and then a little bit more about implicit learning. So. Um, what do we mean by language? Uh, this is what I've done. I love uh, the Wikipedia. I think it is um, a very powerful cultural tool. Uh, it is uh, one of the uh, best things that uh, the internet has created. The, um, I mean, bo I mean both uh, the, the, the frequent and the infrequent are very interesting because um, we have things like English, but also meaning, uh, words, but why words and not sentences? As you can see, words is much more frequent than sentences. But it's also there, by the way, um, if you you search in this um, small. And there are things like human. Um, and then there are, in, if you look also at the tiny things, there are things like syntax, syntax uh, combined, um, uh, complex, um, and then things like um, universal, um, and of course children, and Chomsky is also up there um, on the top. Um, but I recommend to have a look at this uh, book, uh, The Articulate Mammal, uh, uh, by uh, Jimmy A. Chinson. Um, because um, instead of providing a definition, uh, she was given a number of um, concepts that were actually um, interesting when we are trying to define language, but none of them are sufficient. So all of these ideas are um, necessary to understand language, but none of them uh, is, is enough on its own. Um, vocal auditory is um, a clear example. So whenever we are using language, normally we are using the vocal auditory, but obviously there's more than that, not just because they're saying language, but also because we are also using our hands, especially in the Mediterranean area. We are using our hands, but are we also like uh, raising our uh, eyebrows and so on. Um, the other concepts are, um, it would take a whole uh, semester to, to cover all of them. Uh, uh, some of them are trickier. Um, uh, for instance, maybe displacement is a little bit difficult to, to understand. Displacement is uh, basically um, very similar to the idea of arbitrariness. So, so it is, it's this idea that that um, we can talk about things that are not here and now. So what I'm doing just now is a very strong exercise of displacement because I am talking about very abstract things. Uh, I'm talking about language, um, uh, basically. Um, and you know more or less what I'm talking about, but, but it, it is not something that, that we are watching, we are touching. Um, so that's the idea of displacement. And it's also um, similar, again, to the idea of duality, that it might also be, um, you probably are less familiar with it. Um, it's this difference between, um, I mean, duality is probably a, a little bit of an old-fashioned old uh, concept in linguistics, uh, but it's this, this distinction between um, production and comprehension. So, for instance, it, sometimes it's easier to understand things than to produce um, sentences uh, or words, mm, but I mean, in essence, um, let's let's focus in in, in, in two of them. Uh, the idea of arbitrariness uh, that is also present in displacement and, and duality, so that we can talk about things that are not present, present and then the idea of um, creativity. So, with a, a small amount of items, we can produce. Um, completely new sentences, uh, things that haven't said, been said before. Um, like, for instance, I don't know, I'll just, I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, this um, transparent, uh, flexible, metallic can on top of a yellow cloud in uh, the coffee. Uh, maybe someone has said a sentence like that before, but I doubt it. So, so that's 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 what makes uh, language very creative. 
If you want to have a look at this in a much funnier way, I strongly recommend to have a look at this, uh, this uh, video. I'm going to try to be, I mean, YouTube sometimes it is uh, not very reliable. Uh, but you've got the um, uh, script in that uh, link and, um, and they know what they're saying. I mean, I think they probably read the article in Mammal by um, ages of, and basically they're just um, playing with it in a very funny way. Um, so, in essence, four things that language is not about and that I just want to clarify. Language is not uh, literacy, so uh, it doesn't involve formal training, whereas literacy will require uh, not precisely easy uh, training in order to, to learn how to read and write. Uh, language is not just grammar, there's more than grammar. Um, and language is uh, not just communication, so we can use it to think, but also we can communicate with our language. Um, and uh, language is not just thought, sorry there's a typo there, so say thought. Um, thought without uh, language is possible uh, with, uh, for instance, visual safetation, so we can operate with uh, visual pictures, uh, and there's no, uh, no uh, language in those cognitive operations. And vice versa, so we can have language, we can just be waffling about things without actually thinking very much. Okay, um, so finally, in order to understand a little bit more about language, I just want you to reflect about the Turing test. There's no time to, to, to spend on this, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very relevant now. Um, so Turing, Alan Turing in the 1950s, he was really ahead of his times and he was saying that machines in the future will probably be able to produce something very similar to what we are calling language. Uh, and now that we have um, Alexa and uh, Siri and um, Google Home and all those um, speaking devices, um, we can even have a conversation with them. But uh, Turing had predicted that uh, if we spend five minutes, we would basically destroy the machine because we saw that uh, this we are missing uh, some of the features that Aitchison uh, was describing before. So the machine, for instance, uh, is not uh, able to uh, understand uh, our thoughts, uh, our intentions, to anticipate what we're trying to say. It would be very difficult to include these machines, for instance, in, into a conversation where there's more than two people. Right, okay, but, but um, I want you to, to reflect on these and to give, it them, give them a go. Um, uh, the picture below is uh, from Joseph uh, Beisenbaum. He's, he's, uh, he was only 10 years uh, uh, later than um, Alan Turing, uh, but he was really taking it uh, for serious, so he was trying to produce a machine that could talk, and he, he pr uh, developed uh, ELISA, and that's uh, the, one of the very first uh, chatterbots. Another important thing that we have to consider is the fact that um, children learn their first language without uh, any ex explicit training, so, so uh, basically we talk to them, we play with them, but obviously we don't teach them any grammar, or, or we don't teach them any words when they're very little. I mean, we just try to have fun with them, um, and, uh, and there's no specific ex explicit training. So this is something that brings uh, the idea of uh, implicit learning. And there's a classical study in cognitive science. It's not very, uh, it's not very popular, perhaps, or not as popular as I think it should be, because it's really, really, uh, it's been very influential. Um, and I think it's very helpful to understand all the theories that we have seen uh, in the previous, um, in the two previous uh, parts of the lecture. Um, so. Um, Let's try to replicate what um, the author of this story, he was called Reber, uh, what he was trying to do in this experiment. So basically, he was asking um, his participants, there were a number of uh, university students, as, as, uh, as usual, uh, he was asking them to memorize those um, those words, um, so those um, series of letters. So the task that students were supposed to, to be doing were basically to memorize 
those uh, words. So try to um, try to do it yourself because that's the best way of actually understanding um, the idea. So this study was slightly different because it was run in the 1960s, uh, but this was basically um, the, the um, kind of stimuli that uh, Reverb was using. Um, there are more items, but we can't spend too much time. So then, uh, during the test phase, so we've just gone through the training phase or learning phase. During the test phase, what Reber was um, telling these participants was saying, well, she was telling them that they were emissions uh, of an artificial grammar. Um, so it could be something similar to, you know, like aliens uh, language. Uh, and, and, and then he was asking um, these participants to um, try to figure out or decide if um, new emissions would be expectable in that artificial grammar or not. So, assuming that those letters were grammatical in one unknown language to you, now you have to decide if the new words that I'm going to present to you, if you think that they would be grammatically acceptable or not in that um, artificial language. So, participants could, could then uh, watch um, words like that one, um, and, and they have to decide whether that was, that was uh, grammatical or not in that um, possible language. So the first one, for instance, was it grammatical or not? This second one, is it grammatical or not? This third one, is it grammatical or ungrammatical in that language? So one of the critical ideas here is that these are new words, new change um, chain of strings that they hadn't seen before. Um, so the other underlying principle is can we learn the rules um, of this grammar without knowing anything explicitly about these rules? So just by being exposed to a number of um, items from this language can we learn the grammatical principles of the language? Okay, so just if, if you wanted to know, that's, that's, uh, so basically the old numbers were uh, grammatical and the uh, even numbers were not. Um, right, so, um, so basically what Reber did in the 1960s was to create this artificial grammar. These, ty these types of um, algorithms, or visual algorithms, are normally read from left to right. So when it says in, that's uh, the beginning of the um, algorithm. Um, and then um, there's two options, uh, T or V. So all, um, all productions in the language generated by this grammar, or this algorithm, um, would have to start with either T or V. Um, but if it starts with T, then it has to have a P. And then there's a loop there, meaning that there's a non-final numbers of uh, repetitions. So it could be T and then P, 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 um, one million times. Uh, but after that, it has to be a T. So, so with this pretty, pretty simple um, grammar, we can generate a huge number of different um, words or different productions. Uh, and this was basically the grammar that uh, Rebel was using uh, to produce the items that you have seen uh, five, ten minutes ago. Um, and so there are four um, approaches to learning that this study uh, can show. The first one is that there are abstract words with symbolic content uh, in, the, in the way that 
if it starts with a V or a T, then it is grammatical. Uh, so basically, um, we, when we are exposed to, to the items of a language, what we do is to generate these uh, Arston groups. Um, a second option is basically that um, we are sensitive to the um, exemplars that we are processing. So whenever we uh, process uh, one exemplar, uh, we try to, to memorize it. And if some of them are frequent, then we uh, try to... So it is easier to memorize. So frequent items are basically easy to memorize. But in this case, the idea is that when we have a new uh, item, one that we haven't seen before, what we do is to compare them with the exemplars that we have available. Um, so basically, we would just try to uh, find out um, if it is similar enough to those that we have been seeing before. The third one is, is, is basically a more advanced version of the exemplars learning. In this case, what we are doing when we are being exposed to these um, um, new language is to detect chunks of information. Basically, we don't detect them. It's basically the fact that we are very limited in our processing. So we can only get some of them that are uh, more frequent. So in this case, for instance, these two, this combination of two that is very frequent would be what we then use in order to uh, decide between a grammatical and non-grammatical um, um, occurrence. So when we get access to a new word, uh, or when we try to produce a new word, we will be using those chunks of information, basically because we are very limited. Um, the fourth one is not exactly limitation, but the idea is that we human beings are very good are uh, detecting the statistical distribution of items. So we find that some of them are rare, but we also store them. So we, we realize that these rare units um, can be used. So when we have a new one, we use those rare ones. And of course, we also detect that some of them are gradually more productive, gradually more frequent, like those two, so, so they, they tend to happen more often. Uh, and then there are a few of them that are more, even more uh, frequent. So when we get a new, um, a new item, uh, we try to see if those very rare um, combinations that we have spotted are still there, and also those frequent chunks um, are also there. Uh, the difference between the lower left one and the lower right one is that the lower left one is uh, based on uh, our limitation to process information, whereas the uh, lower right one is based on our um, powerful uh, ability to process information.